We finally have budget level CPUs in the market. It's happening. PCs are getting affordable again, at least in one aspect. This is the i3-12100F. The F SKU here means that there's no IGP on it. It's a little bit cheaper as a result. We bought this for $130, and today we're reviewing it. We're mostly looking at this new CPU versus the existing, much more expensive Intel K SKU CPUs. That'd be like the 12600K at the previous low end. And then we also have, obviously, Andy's Ryzen 5 3600, the R5 5600X, and most of the other things that would make sense for the past couple of years. Let's get started on something that's actually pretty affordable. And uh, hopefully it doesn't disappoint us for the performance, but there's always room on the 2022 disappointment PC t-shirt if that happens. Getting started early. Before that, this video is brought to you by Arctic and the Liquid Freezer 2 line of liquid coolers, which tested among the best in our thermal charts for CPU coolers. The Arctic Liquid Freezer series has had continual advancements since our original review, with updates in the mounting kit, including an AMD offset bracket for better thermals, and a longer warranty. Arctic also has its MX5 thermal compound available on the market now if you need some thermal paste for your regular maintenance. Learn more at the links in the description below. So first up, just for clarification purposes, the 12100F is what we bought. The 12100 non-F is more expensive, but the specs are the same. So the only difference between these is the IGP. The integrated graphics processor uh, is either fused off or non-functional in some way. Uh, or just not present on the FSKU CPUs, period, all of them. Any CPU from Intel that ends with F at the end of the numbers, uh, there is no IGP in it. So, and that doesn't preclude things like AGDT where there's just no IGP anyway. The 12100 and the 12100F, we'll put the comparison on the screen from Intel's ARC website. You can see they're identical. There's a couple spots, like there's a two watt difference in the specification for the power consumption or the TDP number. Uh, the IGP difference is obviously there, but PCIe, they're both Gen 5 and Gen 4 capable. They both run 1 by 16 PCIe PEG lanes for the graphics card. They run an additional 4 for an M.2 NVMe SSD or something along those lines. And then everything else is pretty familiar, like DMI is Gen 4. Uh, it's still 8 DMI lanes, and everything else comes off the chipset for HSIO or high-speed IO. So this will work on Z690. It'll work on the newly announced B660, H670 and H610. The CPU is the most suitable for non-Z690. If you're new to this, you shouldn't be buying Z690 motherboards for a 12100 CPU, 12400 CPU, 12500 CPU. It gives you no benefit. Really, the benefit in the Z series boards comes from the ability to overclock. You're not going to have that with a non-K CPU anyway. It is locked from that perspective. But that's good anyway, because $130 to the CPU, if you buy a cheaper board like the B660 or H670 boards, you're saving even more money there. It starts to shape up to be a pretty powerful build at a relatively low cost, so that's great. Uh, the cooler is not impressive from this. We're going to look at the cooler separately in a different deep dive. You should subscribe for that. We have a lot of cooler testing we do involving the flatness of the cold plate. We look at the contact pressure maps. We do noise normalized thermals and normal noise testing. We also do thermals at full speed. So that'll be a separate piece. This cooler is not particularly impressive. We'll talk about that later, but perhaps leave some room in your budget if you have more of a, a noise level focus. If, you, if you're driven crazy by whinier noises, leave room and budget for that. Finally, a quick note before we get started with the charts, H610, that chipset in particular, it is going to be the cheapest. It's the one that'll be the most compelling from a price standpoint. However, it cuts the memory channels in half. So you move down to one memory channel for H610. It will not let you do two memory channels, which is the maximum. Uh, it'll read out as quad with DDR5, it's a different story there. So you get half the channels on H610. You also have a reduction in DMI, and then there are some further reductions like you lose the ability to memory overclock. Overclock here in Intel's terminology just basically means applying XMP. It could be also actual overclocking, but what they're really talking about is can you go beyond the DDR5-4800 or DDR4-whatever that the CPU natively supports. Uh, every board these days except for H610 can. That's been a big change, mostly positively for B660 and H670 here. Okay, enough of that. Let's get started with the benchmarks. We don't really like to look at frequency behavior before benchmarking to understand what we're actually working on. Starting with an all-core workload, the average of all the cores during Blender Cycles rendering was about 40 90 megahertz plotted nearly dead even for the entirety of the test. For reference, the 12900K's average P-core result was 4900 megahertz in our test, 
The E-Core average of the 12900K was 3700 megahertz, and the 12100F doesn't have E-Cores, so that simplifies this chart. There's only the one frequency to look at for this one. In a single core workload with Cinebench, we observed the 12100F's P-Cores fluctuating between 4090 megahertz and 4300 megahertz. This lands it exactly within the expected range, as is established by Intel's spec sheet. In other words, the usefulness here is just knowing that the motherboard is behaving as expected and the CPU is behaving as advertised. Counter-Strike GO is up next. This game is almost entirely CPU bound, but each game will obviously behave a little bit differently, especially across engines. CSGO still runs on DX9, but it remains relevant today. At 1080p, the i3 12100F ran at 251 FPS average on our test bench, resulting in an average FPS between the i9-9900K, once a $500 CPU, and the R9-3900X, also a former $500 CPU. That's impressive and somewhat shocking for a $130 CPU that's not even that much newer than a 3900X or 9900K. Those are only a couple years old. The 12100F here leads even the R5 3600 by about 5%, and the lows are looking good on the 12100. The best CPU on the chart is only, in scare quotes here, 50% better than the 12100F. That's a pretty damn good position for what would traditionally be considered a low-end CPU versus the highest-end CPU. But it will struggle in other games that are potentially more thread-bound, so we'll need to look at some of those. The 1440p results have the 12100F in about the same place. All we've done is put more GPU load on the system, but this only affects the top end results where the GPU was closer to becoming a constraint anyway. The 12100F remains in the same position here as previously. Moving on to Cyberpunk 2077 at 1080p medium, we get a more modern workload for the CPU to process. The entire top half of the chart is basically useless here, since all these parts are bound by the GPU and are within run-to-run -run variants and limitations of each other, so we can't distinguish a difference when there's another bind in place. The i3-12100F, though, isn't fast enough to run into that problem. It ended up at 142 FPS average here, with lows at 97 and 86. Overall, it's completely acceptable performance, especially for Cyberpunk. Comparatively, it's just under the i5-11400 and just over the R9-3900X, once again, with the 3700X and the 3600 a bit behind. The 12100F leads the 3600 by 11% here, which is going to become a theme for the difference between the two, and lows are also comparable between both. In Far Cry 6, another new game that nobody likes, the 12100F ran at 118 FPS average during our multi-pass testing. That landed it just ahead of the i5-11400, the R9-3900X, and about 11% ahead of the R5-3600. That's similar to the cyberpunk gap between the 3600 and the 12100F as well. For comparison, spending $300 on an R5-5600X here would get it about 7% more in average FPS. The lows are about the same. We had noticed previously that Alder Lake appeared to have better scheduling in Windows 11 with this particular game, where 0.1% lows are disproportionately affected than in the other games. The 12600K shows this, where its lows are extremely low for the average, the average FPS that is. The 12100F is an interesting proof of concept. Its lows are excellent, and they're much better than the 12600K, both in Windows 10 for this comparison. But it has no e-cores, so now it's becoming clear what the issue is. We're confident at this point that this comes down to task scheduling in Windows 10, specifically as it relates to e-cores. Windows 10 isn't assigning the work properly, but the 12100F is easy because it doesn't have any e-cores, and so it doesn't run into this complication. It's more traditional in that way. In Red Dead Redemption 2 at 1080p medium, the top couple of results are GPU bound, but the rest are unrestricted. So we only lose the sense of scaling or percent differences at the high end versus the low end. The 12100F ran at 139 FPS average here, leading the 3600 only slightly, although it did have slightly better lows, yet not necessarily appreciable to a human player. The 12100F is led by the 3900X in this one, finally, for average FPS, so this makes a little more sense, logically. Lows are about the same between them as well. As for the R5-5600X, the lead over the 12100F is 19% in exchange for the near doubling in price. Total War is finally working on Windows 10 Alder Lake CPUs, although it has always worked with Windows 11 and Alder Lake CPUs. We haven't rerun our 12900K and 12600K with Windows 10, so the results here are in Windows 11, uh, in general, we haven't seen a huge gap between these. We did do a head-to-head -head test, but it is a change that can throw off the percent scaling just a little bit. Regardless, this game is relatively good for scaling across the entirety of the CPU stack. The i3-12100F ran at 188 FPS average, more than playable, and maintained lows in step with the rest of the CPU results here. It's scaling proportionally, 
the lead versus the 3700X and the 3600 is about 11%, while the 5600X leads the 12100 by 7%. The 12100F is in a strong position overall here. Lows are good, average is good, and its performance is better than a CPU that was once nearly $400. Up next is Rainbow Six Siege. Rainbow Six brings us back to ultra high FPS games and a very hard CPU bind. The i3-12100F ran at 420 FPS average here. By itself, that sounds high, and it is, but it always comes down to relative comparisons here. Having frame rates as high as 420 doesn't necessarily mean that the CPU is the best CPU, uh, although certainly it is in more than playable territory. You'd obviously have a good overall gaming experience with this frame rate, uh, but we still get some good relative percent scaling between the others. The 12100F is right between the 3700X and the 3600 for average FPS. It's behind both in lows, although not in a way that any human would notice. The CPU is less advantaged here than it is in some of the prior tests, but it's still overall in a good spot for value. The 11400 leads by 5%, the 3900X by a much more suitable 7% than before, and the 5600X leads by 14%. The 10900K still does well here, likely partly from run-to-run -run variants and partly from in-hardware mitigations found in the later CPUs. If you're curious what it looks like when there's a GPU bind instead, here it is. This is the same test at 1440p. The ceiling is now at 355 to 360 FPS average or so, and the 12100F nearly achieves that. They're all about the same at this point, so it gives some perspective on limiting yourself on the GPU. At some point, the CPU doesn't matter quite as much, at least not for only gaming. There may be some argument for future-proofing to the extent that it's possible, or maybe if you do production workloads, but for this game with these settings, we become bound. F1 2021 is up now. We recently had to completely rerun this suite to do a game patch, so our set of data here is more limited than the charts you've just seen. It is, however, from the past week, so it's brand new. The i3-12100F ran at 300 FPS average here, leading the R5-3600 by 11%. This is one of the most consistent leads we've seen ever in a CPU review. It's almost always 11%. The R5-5600X leads the i3-12100F by 16%, it's not a big value add in games like this, or games in general, despite potential in production workloads. Speaking of, time to look at some of those production charts. For production, Blender is up first. We're using the Cycles tile-based renderer in Blender to render a frame from a complex GN logo animation. You can see some examples of our other animations and renders in our recent disappointment build, although most of these use Unreal Engine in real-time rendering. In fact, our limited disappointment PC 2021 t-shirts were entirely designed in Blender the software we're benchmarking right now. And they're available on store.gamersnexus.net for a limited time to commemorate last year and to support our operation for this year. The Blender results had the 1200F toward the bottom of the chart, predictably. This benchmark spawns one tile per thread, so the 30-minute render time falls 20% behind the R5 3600. The 3600 benefits mostly from its core and thread advantage here, uh, although it's not all about threads, of course, the combination is enough with the architecture to significantly reduce the render time. The 5600X pulls further ahead at 30% time reduced versus the 12100F. Thus far, you should buy from further up the stack, or from AMD, something like the Intel 12600K or one of AMD's CPUs here, if you're planning on doing a significant amount of this type of work or mixing it in daily with your gaming. In Chromium Code Compile benchmarking, we're looking at one specific type of compile workload to broadly represent gaming. The 12100F falls to the bottom of the chart in this one. At 138 minutes to compile in Chromium, it's painfully slow. And the 12900K, just for an extreme reference, requires 65% less time to do the same work. Closer in price, though, at at least one point in time, the R5-3600 required 21% less time to do this work. The 5600X is similarly ahead, and everything else right now is ahead in significant ways, mostly. If you occasionally do this type of compile or work, it's survivable. But this style of workload, if it appears daily or even every couple days, would make it worth considering a better CPU, especially if you're making money from whatever you're compiling, because now it's starting to hold you up. The Adobe Premiere benchmark is more of a mixed workload than the previous two workloads we looked at, calculating for filter application, rendering, scrubbing, playback, and effects. The 12100F scored 589 points in aggregate. That allowed the 3600 a lead of 11%, and the 5600X a lead of 24%. The 12600K scored 52% higher, so we're looking forward to the 12400 entry in our upcoming review. The CPU is doing fine for gaming, and it can run these production applications, clearly, but it shouldn't be relied on for them regularly. Adobe Photoshop is up now, also ranked with aggregate scoring of filters, transforms, warps, effects, and saving. 
The 12100F did much better here than in Premier, at least comparatively, running 11% ahead of the 3600 and swapping with the Premier results versus the same CPU. It's not distant from the R9 3900X either. The 5600X still leads, but the 12100F was more competitive in this one than the previous three production tests. 7-zip testing is scored in millions of instructions per second. In compression testing, the 12100F operated at 46K MIPS allowing the R5 3600 to compress 34% faster than the 12100F. As in the past several results, it's the same conclusion. It's okay, but don't buy it for this type of workload explicitly. It's far more suited to gaming. Decompression isn't any better. We sometimes see an architectural advantage in either compression or decompression, but this time we don't. <laughs> we see it's, it's doing worse, really, more than anything. We see the CPU at the bottom of the chart, but it fell further behind in the relative sense than in compression. Finally, a look at power consumption. The i3-12100F under a full all-core workload measured after tau at 5 minutes, not that it's really relevant here, requires 55 watts steady. Considering its blender performance is overall unexciting, that marks the 5600X as far more efficient for the same work. However, for the i3, a gaming workload would be more advantageous for it, and clearly that's where the 12100F is more suitable. In our one-thread Cinebench benchmark, the 12100 pulled 22 watts for a single-core workload, including, of course, the VRM efficiency losses. That has it at the lowest power consumption for an individual core we've yet tested, although the 5600X is basically within an error here. It's, at worst, tied for the lowest. So, at $130, it's actually a pretty exciting CPU for us to review because We've been mostly looking at expensive stuff for a while now. It's not necessarily our choice. Intel only launched expensive CPUs for all. Like, that's pretty normal for a company to start out with its highest end. Uh, however, when AMD did that, started out with the 5600X, 58, 59, 59, 50X, is 300 plus for all those, and nothing ever came after that. Unless you count the 5600G, and that's kind of a different market at that point. So market neglected there for low end by AMD, but they didn't need to fulfill that market with the general supply shortages, especially when that stuff started rolling out, AMD was able to get away with it. Intel is now starting to pressure AMD. That's excellent because it means AMD is in a position where it will have to launch something at the cheaper side of things, and that's where we get a thriving market. So good to see. However, right now, Intel doesn't have competition here other than itself. The 5600G doesn't count. It's a little more expensive anyway, not competitive. So the 12100F, uh, and we are working on a 12400 review as well, so can't comment on those numbers right now. But the 12100F versus the higher end stuff we've benchmarked, plus some of the previous low end stuff, like um, to some extent the i5 11400, the i5 10400, the AMD R5 3600 was a mid range CPU that's now basically low end. It's appearing in a lot of OEM pre built machines, things of that nature. This is pretty close to or outperforming in most instances. The i3 12100F or 12100 non F. Not a good suit for anything that's like production workloads. So uh, Blender cycles rendering where you tile-based rendering, code compile, compression, decompression, this doesn't do those well. It's okay, it can get you by. So it's not like if you run one of those things, if you run one compile every two weeks, you can do it while you sleep or leave the house, it'll be fine. But uh, if you're doing that any, with any frequency whatsoever, you're making money off those production workloads we benchmarked, probably it's worth trying to save up and buy a different CPU. Uh, even something like a 3600 in some cases would be better, even though it's a bit older, because this just doesn't do those things that well, or certainly not competitively. Now, to be clear, it's okay, but that's not really what the CPU is meant to do. Four core, eight thread, uh, that's, they're kind of limited these days for things like that. For gaming, it did very well. So an i3 right now, reviving the old trope of an i5 is enough for gaming, as we said, with the uh, i3s that supplanted the i7 7700K previously, and i3 is in this context enough for gaming, especially for a budget build, and you're, you're likely to be bound somewhere else if you're really restricted on budget anyway than this particular CPU for gaming, and even with a high-end GPU, it's, it's doing pretty well. So we were impressed with the gaming performance. So at this point, we are fine with recommending the 12100F. There's one note or one caveat here that needs to we really want to highlight, which is that we are working on the 12400, and Intel has something like 22 total SKUs it's announced. We're not going to test all of them, but we're going to look at the i5s too, and we haven't done that yet other than the 12600K. So give us a little bit. We're going to be back 
probably pretty much immediately with the 12400 review, and then we'll make a firm judgment on should you buy this one or should you buy the 12400 uh, from a value perspective. What we can say, though, in an absolute sense, is that this CPU does just fine for the gaming we've tested, and uh, we have no problems recommending it for a budget gaming build where the money matters, either because you need it for other things in your life, that's totally fine, you should focus on those things anyway, uh, or just because you're cost conscious and you like to really min-max your budget on what you're buying. Maybe you want to spend the money on a GPU instead or something like that. So this CPU does well for its price category. We didn't run into any games in our test suite where it was dropping frames, uh, certainly not to the extent of being unplayable. So i3s used to be fairly unplayable in some games, and they developed a stigma because of that, and it was well-deserved. But that's broken with this one and with the previous i3s most recently. So this one we're good with. We'll let you know about the 12400 if we think that one's a better deal or not, but check back. And then uh, we're obviously looking out for AMD stuff right now. They have nothing to compete in this price class. We don't consider the 5600G a competitor. And even if we do, it loses. So it's irrelevant. The only thing you lose with the F version here versus like an APU is obviously the IGP. Uh, but I mean, if you're buying an APU for the integrated graphics, that's still going to outperform Intel's anyway. So you don't really need our opinion on that because it's just fact at this point. So uh, that's it for this one. Intel looking pretty good right now. We're happy to see the budget market come back and um, more excited to see what AMD comes out with to keep it going so Intel doesn't do the same thing that AMD does and sort of rug pull and leave everyone with only a high end of the next generation. That's it for this one. Thank you for watching. As always, subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly with buying these types of things to review, where you can grab one of our newest shirts. These are the Limited Disappointment 2021 shirts, where it's got the tour dates on the back for the most disappointing products of the year. And you can grab that on store.gamersnexus.net. Thank you for watching. We'll see you all next time.